If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, continue our uh, brief series here in the season of Advent, reflecting on the glory of Christ and his, his twofold Advent. It's good for us to remember that the Advent is just uh, not only Christ's coming in his incarnation, but also his coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. It's a twofold Advent. We give some attention here to his incarnation and his birth. So Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Let's give our attention to God's word. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So far the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Father, it is often the familiar things that can be the most devastating to our focus and our our growth in grace because we have grown too accustomed to uh, handling holy things. So, Father, forgive us for, for being too casual with your word, but, Lord, protect us also from being falsely reverent, and we pray, Lord, that you would be present in our understanding, that you would illuminate our minds, that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts to receive exactly what you seek to give us through your word this morning. Would you bind up the brokenhearted, draw near to the hurting, and comfort the comfortless this morning, we pray, O Lord, through your word, work wonders as you have promised to do. It will not return void. We are confident in it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Southern author Flannery O'Connor once said this about Christians living in a secular age. She said this, you have to push back against the age as hard as it pushes against you. She went on to say, what people don't realize is how much religion costs. What people don't realize is how much religion costs. They think faith is a big electric blanket when, of course, it is the cross. 
Not all of us might be totally familiar with what electric blankets are. Um, I remember one in, in, a, in a relative's house growing up that seemed like it was more of, a, more of a weapon than a comfort. It seemed like it could get so hot. But, but the idea here is there's, there's normal blankets and then there's electric blankets. Normal blankets keep you a little bit warm. Electric blankets keep you really, really warm super comfortable. You can adjust the temperature to your desires. O'Connor here is saying that we tend in our secular age to think about faith as a big electric blanket, but she says, no, that's not it at all. Faith and the life of faith is the life of the cross. And so how do we push back as Christians living in a secular age, which is always tempted to to turn faith into abstract, impersonal comfort that you can purchase instead of something that purchases you. She identifies very accurately the problem we face as Christians. We increasingly find ourselves as aliens in a foreign land. We want the electric blankets to help us cope with life in this veil of tears. We're desperate for resolution to pain. We are so eager for relief. How do we push back? Well, we could, we could think of that maybe primarily of ways in which we push back against social pressures or, or social currents of unbelief and so on. But, but it seems that the more important enemy often lies within, almost always lies within. How do we push back against the idolatry of our own hearts? By choosing the cross over the electric blanket. And and that seems to me to be one of the best arguments for giving heed to the incarnation today. Not necessarily because it's a certain time of year, but, but because it is a certain time of year and we are awash in such a materialistic, consumeristic society, and and everyone here has a lot of things to do. We need to give heed to the Incarnation because otherwise, faith and Christ become the things that help us cope while we're trying to get through what we need to get through, But, but it's so upside down to think that way. That's why we need the Incarnation now, and that's why we need the Incarnation today so that we would choose what the incarnation is aiming towards, which is the cross. Otherwise, we're overrun with stocking stuffers and trinkets. There's no glory there. It's heading for goodwill. It's the advent of Christ. It's the twofold advent of Christ that demands our attention. So my plea with you this morning, aware of what day it is, is that you would clear your mind of distractions and that you would fix your eyes on Christ and that you would realize where you are and that you would hear him today, the humble glory of his first advent and the triumphant glory of his second advent yet to come. Take all the electric blankets, give us Christ. Well, how was Christ given to us? Two ways we want to focus on today. First, this morning, he was given to us in glory. And then this evening, he was given to us as a gift. So this morning, the glory. Tonight, the gift. Four points this morning. Uh, Providence. How was Christ given to us in glory? Through providence, through pilgrimage, through peace, and unto praise. Firstly, providence. Caesar's census. The text in chapter 2 starts out very similarly to how chapter 1 started out. Chapter 1 started out with what? In the days of Herod. How does chapter 2 start out? Very similarly. In the days of Caesar. A decree went out from Caesar. Who was Caesar? He was the first official. This this Caesar was the first official emperor of the Roman Empire. Uh, You'll remember that the Roman Republic preceded the Roman Empire. So so the Roman Republic gave way over time gradually to the Roman Empire and the rise of the Caesars. Julius Caesar had served before Caesar Augustus. Julius was kind of a transitional figure, a dictator, if you will. Caesar Augustus was the first to have the title of emperor. 
His name was originally Octavian. The Roman Republic, according to historians, came to an end right around 27 BC, and that's when Octavian was made uh, princeps, or the first citizen. What a title. Not only emperor, but first citizen. Took the title of Augustus. Augustus, we get that English word august, or, or august, it's kind of a more antiquated term now as a, not just as a month, but as a description of a person. Um, but what this word means, Augustus, is great, revered, or something like blessed by the gods. He was the great nephew and adopted heir of Julius Caesar. And as he comes to power, it's, it's important to remember that the previous 100 years of the, of the Roman Republic, what was becoming the empire, was, was filled with almost constant quasi-civil war. It, it was a, a relentless period of bloodshed and infighting and, and political betrayal and genuine military conflict, almost constant war and civil strife. But the next 200 years would not be completely different, but quite different. You may be familiar with the term the, the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. That's what came to characterize the empire, not exclusively, but but in a significant way over the next 200 years. But we have, we have two different types of peace at work here, don't we, in our text. The Pax Romana was backed up by force, but there's another peace, the Pax Christi, the peace of Christ, backed up by what? Sacrifice. Luke 1, in the days of Herod, Luke 2, in the days of Caesar. Luke 1, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Luke 2, in the days of Caesar, king of the world. So if John came in the days of Herod, who was king of the Jews, king of Judea, Christ, Luke is saying, is coming in the days of Caesar, emperor of the world, king of peace, so called. Luke 1, in the days of Herod. Luke 2, in the days of Caesar, king of the world. What will Jesus say in Matthew 28? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So like Pharaoh before him, like Cyrus before him, God is making Caesar into a tool. Allowing him to count so that David's son would go to David's city in order to bring David's greatest son into the world at exactly the place that the prophets foretold. Proverbs 21 says, A king's heart is a water channel in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. Caesar's census. The census is a witness. It's an objective testimony to the time and place of Jesus birth. It marks it in history. Remember, this is Luke's priority. He wanted to give an orderly account to Theophilus so he would have confidence concerning the things he had been taught. And so it's a witness. The census serves as a witness. It's saying it happened here at this time, in this place. And this is critical for the apostles. Think about in Acts, in Acts 5. What do they say? We are witnesses of these things along with the Holy Spirit. And then what would Paul say in Acts 28, preaching before Felix? Say, Felix, these things didn't happen in a corner. They're public. And isn't that exactly how Jesus' ministry was? While, while he did minister in people's houses, he was also ministering on mountainsides and on waterfronts and preaching to large crowds. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you can go and talk to hundreds of people. Some of them have died, but most of them are still alive. They saw him. They saw him. And so there's this, this new exodus taking place for God's people. And it, will, it might be a census by day. But what's really happening is the blazing light and glory that will come at nighttime. So census by day, glory by night. Get David's son to David's city. It's time. And that leads to a pilgrimage. 
So God's providence leads to a pilgrimage. Our second point, Joseph and Mary, they come to the city of the king. What is that? Kids, you know the name of it. What is the city of the king where Jesus is born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Uh, Many have observed that Bethlehem could be translated into English as house of bread. But others have observed that it could also be translated as house of war. And that's really helpful because that does represent, I think, in a way, the, the twofold nature of what's happening here. It's very fitting. Or twofold advent in which Christ will return in glory, but first he must be fed. He must grow in wisdom and stature. He must become who he was born to be. This is where all the stories are getting their source material. All the great stories of of the king born in exile, raised up in shadows until that day when it is time for him to fight, when it is time for him to go to war, to reclaim what is rightly his. It's not just treasure, but people. Like the prophet said, a treasured possession. First, he must come forth in natural birth. So while we can't give attention to everything in the text this morning, I do want to briefly comment on Jesus' birth. He is born. He's born. Many have said that it is, it is his, his conception that is miraculous and his birth is ordinary. That is true. Of, of course, that's true. But think about that for a second. It's actually the ordinariness of his, of his birth that makes it such a profound expression of his glory and his meekness. Because to say that the, that the conception is miraculous, while that is true, the, the miracle seems to be in keeping with the dignity of the eternal Son of God. But birth? Birth canal? And everything that goes along with it. For the God-man. It's the ordinary nature of the birth that is such a profound expression of his humiliation. Kids, you have to remember that Jesus wasn't just humiliated on the cross. We confess that his whole life, especially at the end, but his whole life was suffering. His whole life was humiliation. It's the the natural way in which he's brought forth that makes the supernatural nature of his conception so amazing because he's brought forth in such humility. An expression of his glory and his meekness. Not only his, but, but also his mother's. Rebecca Jones, the, uh, the, the wife of uh, theologian Peter Jones, says this uh, in a recent uh, comment I saw her make about Mary. Uh, she said, no painkillers for Mary. There was no mom there waiting to see how she could help. No uh, family text threads with updates or what's the name. No doctor. She ends her comments there. She's a teenage virgin, keenly aware of who it is she bears. According to his humanity, he is utterly dependent on her. According to his humanity, he is utterly dependent on her. According to his divinity, she is utterly dependent on him. As many church fathers have commented, he who made Mary is brought forth from Mary. It's an amazing thing. He is utterly dependent on her. She is utterly dependent on him. She's the queen mother of her maker and her Lord. It's not overstating it to to describe her in that way. She's the mother of the king. And it's not kept secret. It's not kept secret. John came before him. He would go before him. And the angels, they make royal proclamation. This is no longer just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is the, the deafening roar and proclamation of heavenly hosts, of, of, of angelic military 
force coming to go before their king. To go before their king. The united cry and shout and exclamation of Christ's legions. Glory to God, they say. And they come to proclaim peace, our third point. The angel and the angelic host proclaim the brilliance of God's glorious promise of peace and his good pleasure. It's Sometimes we, we kind of blow right past it. I was, I was struck in reflecting on this text that there's, that there's a, a twofold nature to the announcement. It's not just the host. But what does it start with? It starts with the angel of the Lord. Just one would be enough, <laughs> I think. For, for any of us, one would be enough. The angel of the Lord comes to proclaim the birth of Christ to these shepherds. Um, one commentator says we should be really careful not to sort of glamorize the, the sort of agricultural uh, uh, romance of, of shepherding work. These were generally considered outcasts, um, uh, and ceremonially unclean, perhaps even sometimes uh, c- criminal individuals. So what a contrast between the angels and the shepherds in, in terms of their uh, purity, but, but also a, a stark reminder to us of who it is that Jesus came to first, who his birth is proclaimed to first. It is not at the palace, but it's in the fields. It's in the fields, and they come to, come to proclaim peace, but it comes first with glory. The glory of the Lord, it says, shines around the shepherds as the angel comes forth. It's not the angel's glory, as terrifying as he would be. It's God's glory that lights up the night. And it shines around, it says in the ESV. Uh, this is one of two places in the New Testament where this word is used, or this expression is used. You know where else it's used? Is Paul recounting his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. And he says that the glory of Christ, when Jesus confronted him on the Damascus road, he says the glory of Christ there was brighter than the sun. This is not silent night for the shepherds in any case. Christ's glory, the glory of the Lord is brighter than the sun. Paul would go on to say this to the Corinthians, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this is a a glory that is intended to magnify the message of the messenger as it comes from God, but it it is the glory of God, therefore it's the glory of Christ. And though he is in a manger, nevertheless, his glory shines out of darkness. The glory of Christ shines out of darkness. It shines into darkness. That Christ penetrates. He pierces that shadow of this age. He will will tear a veil open in his crucifixion. Here it's, it's, it's a fulfillment of what the prophets foretold. They say, God, would you rend the heavens and come down? That's what this is. It's an invasion of this world. It's a beachhead in the present evil age of God tearing open not just a veil, but the heavens themselves in order to send his Messiah. And so, of course, it's accompanied by angels. Of course, it's accompanied by angels in the face of Jesus Christ. Luke 2.10, the angels, what do they say? Or the messenger, rather. Not angels yet, but the angel says, Fear not. They would need that reassurance. For I bring you gospel tidings of great joy. The idea here is mega joy. Mega joy. But but it's not mega in terms of size or volume. You know, like a bigger joy. I bring you bigger joy than you've known before. That's not the idea here. The idea here is an extraordinary joy, an unusual joy, a peculiar joy that is not connected to any other source except for this child, right? It's an extraordinary joy, great joy. That's what the angel is saying. I bring you an unusual joy. 
It's the same thing Mary said in, in the Magnificat. The Lord has done great things for me. That's the same thing. This is extraordinary. It's an astonishing thing. Extraordinary, unusual, abnormal. It's of the Spirit. It's of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Good news of great joy. The fruit of Mary's womb is of the Spirit. The, the message of the angels, of, of the glad tidings of Christ who has come, is intended to, to generate that same fruit, that same joy, because they flow from the same source. So that the Spirit who, who overshadowed Mary is the same Spirit who is within us. That's not an unusual statement at all in the New Testament. These things are so united. Our union with Christ means that we are one with Him and one with His Spirit. It's better that I go, He said. I will send a helper. Brought Him in His incarnation brings us in our own flesh and blood to experience unusual things that you cannot chalk up to your own personality. You cannot chalk up to a, pers uh, a personality test or, or just a commitment to try and do things a different way. It's of the Spirit. When the Spirit brings forth fruit in your life, it's an extraordinary thing. It's not of you. It's from another world. That's a great joy. <laughs> That's glad tidings. It's extraordinary because it's rooted in God and the Incarnation. That's why we can be very confident in God and the Gospel, even when our response doesn't always capture what it ought to or, or be characterized by the sort of joy that we would like it to be, or especially when our circumstances testify against us because our joy does not come from our circumstances. One commentator says, this is eschatological joy. What he means by that is it's the joy of the new creation given in Christ. It does not depend upon you, but it is given to you. Luke 2, verse 11 will get our attention this evening. But suffice it to say, this is a personal message of royal magnitude. Unto you is born this day. He's come unto you. That will give our attention this evening. Luke 2, verse 12. This will be a sign for you. Clothing in a manger. This is more than a clue or a traffic sign. Turn left, turn right, go straight. That's not what sign means here. Sign, in the Bible, is an indication of God intervening in the created order to demonstrate His power. Signs in the Old Testament were neither good nor bad. It depended on how God intended to use them. A sign could be, in Samuel's case, his, his sons uh, dropping dead because of their wickedness. That was a sign, God said, or it could be an indication of his blessing. And so the angel says, the sign of the Messiah will be what, what he's wearing and where he is, which I think is really interesting because it doesn't say the sign that will be that he's conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. How would they know? How would they know? So, so the angel points to the most ordinary things about the circumstances of his birth to verify God's divine purpose. And the angel's announcement then is not the end of the gospel message, it's only the beginning. It is unto worship. Is it not? Suddenly, verse 13, unto worship, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The, shepherd had, the shepherds had already been told, fear not. Whatever assurance came from that comfort seems to be evaporated in a second heavenly host. The shepherds, they're toast. 
They're toast. This is a, this is a military force. Well, what do they say? Peace. That's not typically how an expeditionary force acts. All right. that, was that Normandy? Was that D-Day? Peace unto you. But here, that's exactly what it is. A military force comes proclaiming peace. We don't know how large the host is, but to use just a figure of speech, it's a million to one. They're outnumbered. There's, there's nothing except death, except it's pure life, because it's glory to God and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased, those who are the object of his good pleasure. Peace proclaimed by military force. It's an indication of how upside down the kingdom of Christ will be. Glory to God for this day, the angels are saying, and for the dawning of hope that our king, that our king would humble himself to dust. How hard is it for us to humble ourselves to the dust? Not as hard as it was for Jesus. But gladly he did for our salvation. Kids, this is kind of like the Lion King. You remember that scene from the Lion King, the, the old one, where, where Simba is born and uh, Rafiki, the monkey, comes, who's like the, the counselor, the wise counselor, he comes and takes him from his parents and leads him out to the edge of Pride Rock, and he holds him up for, for all the animal kingdom to see. Do you remember what the animals do? The monkeys start clapping, and the zebras are pounding their hooves into the dust, and the giraffes as well, and the whole animal kingdom is, is exploding in praise and, and, and clapping and stomping, and then what do they do? They all bow. They all bow into the dust. Oh, look, he's not, he doesn't even have claws. Well, they're not bowing to his power. They're bowing to his, his future. They're bowing to who he is and what he will accomplish, more than they can really understand. But they're bowing to him, and that's kind of what's happening here, but to a much greater degree where, where the shepherds, they go to Christ and they bow before him because he is greater than them and he will purify them they make haste to praise him they make haste to praise him you know it's interesting I don't know if Luke intended to be intended this to be humorous but it struck me as somewhat humorous verse 15 when the angels went away from them into heaven it's our fourth po our fourth point the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. I don't know, that just, that struck me as, as a little bit humorous. Like it was, almost like it was their idea. So, so the angel of the Lord, this heavenly host, and then it's like the shepherds are saying, you know what? Maybe we should go. Maybe, maybe we should listen to them. Maybe we should do what they said. And so they, they go and they make haste. As we sing, haste, haste to bring him laud, not just for a baby, for more than a baby. And then they spread the news, chapter 2, 17 to 20, they spread the news, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. And it says towards the end of our passage that Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen as it had been told them. What it means that she treasured and pondered is that she did not let these things go from her soul. She did not let these things go from her soul. She did not understand everything that had just happened. There's no way she could possibly understand the comprehensive nature of what had happened and what would happen. But nevertheless, she saw the value of it, and so she hid it. She hid it within her heart. What are, we, what are we encouraged to do? The Proverbs, to hide God's word in our heart that we would not sin against him. 
Mary, she treasures these things and she begins to meditate and contemplate and seek to understand what just happened. And isn't that what we're called to do as well as God's people? We do not understand. We we see so much more than Mary, but we're just on the outskirts of our understanding of God's love for us, of His true presence with us, of His generosity to us, of His calling to us to walk the way of the cross. Not to have a theology of glory, but a cruciform theology. We understand only the outskirts of these things, but we know that God is shining His light into our hearts, just as He did that night to the shepherds, that we see in the face of Jesus Christ an even greater glory. It's the glory of the gospel. Isn't that what Paul says? That the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ And what does he go on to say in that very same letter? So, as we behold him, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. It is by by never moving on from Christ, but by pondering all the treasure we have in him, that we grow deeper and deeper into who he is and who he has called us to be. And that's why the incarnation of Christ is so critical for us to understand, But because it is only the first advent. And there's another Advent to come. It's only the first of his Advents. And there's another one to come. And as we live in this time between the times, this time of waiting, we give great praise that Christ has come. We bring our sins to him because he calls us to himself. Come to me. If you're weary and you're heavy laden, you can come to Jesus. Why? Because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. You'll find rest for your souls. You'll find rest for your souls. And then we are called to love his appearing. Not only his first, but his second. To long for it with eager expectation. To eagerly wait for it. To trust that one day he will wipe every tear. And, and that's uh, not only that, but we read of, uh, of that hope and, and of our future to come in in Revelation. This little child would grow to be slain, would be raised to glory, and one day we will say with the elders who fall down before him this, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature in heaven and on earth says this, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, who are we to be recipients of your grace, to have the, the treasure of Christ fill our cups? We are nothing but poor beggars. Yet by your grace you have made us and remade us in, in order to be more and more like Christ. And so may we rest in him today. May greed cease. May envy cease. May anger die. That Christ might be all in all. May you fill us with the fruit of your Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that brought Christ into this age, renews us in this age, that we might be truly joyful. Lord, may we not judge your presence by our circumstances, but may we judge our circumstances by your presence with us, through us, in us, in this age, and in the age to come. Thank you for this day, this Lord's day, where we can come and worship you, and and we pray that, that you would continue to fill your people and give us rest in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.